Hey, so hi, welcome to Machine Learning 101, or a developer's guide to machine learning. Um, if you guys were in Barbara's class, like or Barbara's session um, just before this one, where she talked about neural networks and deep learning being indistinguishable from magic, this is kind of like the totally other way around. This is machine learning. It's basically just pattern matching, glorified pattern matching in big chunks of data. And uh, if any of you have seen me before talking about debugging, this is essentially what I've done my whole life. He's looking at big chunks of data, trying to do pattern matching and finding like errors and, <clears throat> and problems. But let's talk about machine learning. So uh, funnily enough, she also mentioned this particular problem, um, which is a huge problem in computer vision or in machine learning, distinguishing chihuahuas from muffins. Um, or rather a classification of images. Um, so just raise of hands. Like, so we got a chihuahua and a muffin. Who of you thinks that this is the chihuahua? Okay, pretty intelligent crowd, <laughs> yay. Um, so think for a moment and think about how did you know that that was the chihuahua? Because that, that is the correct answer, by the way. Um, either um, either you've seen enough dogs to kind of know that this is a dog and this is not, or if you're like me, you've seen enough muffins to know that this is a muffin and that is not. And you can kind of distinguish some patterns in dogs, like they got eyes, they got ears, they got nose, a bunch of stuff like that. And that kind of distinguishes it from the paper cup of the muffin. So um, if you were to write an application, that separates muffins from chihuahuas, you would probably write something like this. And this was sort of like the rule-based engines that were wrote like when I studied AI in college like 20 years ago. And it's also kind of what we've been dealing with before machine learning. So <clears throat> apart, like I said, this code has a couple of issues. Um, I can't spell chihuahua, uh, which is of course an issue, but not the biggest one. Um, the bigger one is picture contains. It's an insanely hard piece of code to write unless you have machine learning to back it up. And even if you did and you wrote this code, um, you would get kind of lost when you were met with something like this. Because <laughs> suddenly your rules just don't match anymore. <clears throat> um, so what do you do? Well, you kind of go back to the way humans think because that's sort of what machine learning is based on. And one thing that humans do is draw from their experience. So what you do to solve this problem, instead of using those heuristic um, questions, you instead send a lot of pictures of chihuahuas and say, these are all chihuahuas. And you send a lot of pictures of muffins and say, these are all muffins. And you use one of Barbara's cute neural networks. And the neural network figures out there is a pattern in chihuahuas that's not present in muffins, and it kind of distinguishes between the two. Now, this is a problem that's already been solved. So you don't necessarily need to solve it. It's solved in many ways. Uh, one of those ways is through Microsoft Cognitive Services. Uh, Google has some, a lot of other companies have some, but if this is the problem you're trying to solve, you can just call into an API and be done. No machine learning needed. Um, <clears throat> you can, of course, fix up like if you wanted to distinguish between chihuahuas and, um, I don't know, other breeds of dogs, you might have to train it a little bit, but you can still do that just through API calling. <clears throat> and it will tell you things like, it's a dog, it's, um, <clears throat> it's cute, like it knows that. <clears throat> I'm sorry. And, um, but either way, it's just an API. Uh, <clears throat> and if you want to use it, just go to Microsoft Cognitive Services. But, and, and there are a lot of issues like that that are already solved. Like things like um, the general case of face recognition or something like sentiment analysis, trying to find out if someone is smiling or if someone is sad, or if you, <clears throat> you can do sentiment analysis on pictures, but also on text. So um, if you send out a phone and want to know what people thought about it, you can kind of examine the, um, the feed and see if people thought it was top-notch or not. But 
uh, there are some issues that haven't been solved. And they haven't been solved in a general case because they require very specific data. So we're going to take a look at one of those problems. Um, and we're going to kind of go through the process of machine learning and understand what's involved in it. So uh, in Sweden, it's kind of a national sport to go and see houses. Like, I heard some people were from Sweden, and you know that this is true. Um, so at one point in my life, I went to like six showings a weekend. And then my husband had an intervention with me, and I can no longer go and see houses anymore. So um, I gather a lot of data about houses, because that's ultimately what I did when I went to see showings. And instead, now I use it for science. So um, I take that data, and I'm trying to use that data to figure out um, how to predict the price of a house, given certain parameters that I gather. So um, what I've done here, these are real houses in my neighborhood. Um, and I have a list of the area of the houses in square meters and the price in 1,000 crowns. So 1 million crowns is approximately 100,000 pounds. Um, so I gather the data. And then the next thing I do is I try to visualize it to kind of get a feel for the data, to know if it's linear or if it like, follows a curve or has some other weird pattern to it. Um, so I, I do that through a plot like this, where you dot out the, uh, the different kind of value pairs. And this is called a scatter plot. And it's extremely useful in the, in the area of machine learning or data science. Um, and then I go through and I do that for all of these dots. And now my task, the thing that I want to predict is how much is a house that's 150 square meters? So any takers, how much do you think it was worth? Six and a half million. Yeah, six and a half million, give or take. Um, how did you know that? Linear line. Yeah, see, right, if you squint, it's kind of like a line. And this is what machine learning is. So now, the line is something called linear regression. This is one of the algorithms in machine learning. It's a straight line. It's just mathematics. Um, and fitting it to the data, kind of like moving it so that it has the right slope, that's called fitting the model. And the actual line is now called a model. And this is what you use to do predictions on machine learning. So now we can use this line and say, Okay, 150, yeah, 6.2, 6.3, somewhere around there. So, good stuff. Uh, now we're kind of halfway through in the machine learning process. Because the next step is that machine learning is just predictions. Like, you're not actually calculating real numbers or predicting, like, or saying that this is for a fact the absolute truth. We're just doing a guess. And the question then is, how good is that guess? Well. What we can do now is um, figure out something called the confidence interval, which tells us how good our guess is. And in a case like this, we can just use a marker and do this. So we kind of do a marker around all the dots, because not all the dots are on, on that straight line. And this will now tell us how far off we are at maximum. So um, we're give or take like, I don't know, half a million crowns off, like 50,000 pounds off which can seem kind of excessive, but we can fix that by giving more parameters. Because obviously, not, the area is not the only reason or not the only factor in how much a house is. And so we can fix that in a number of ways. That's one way to fix it. We can also fix it by having a better model, maybe that fits the data a little bit better. Now, one thing I left off here was, um, in the course of writing things down, I wrote some things wrong. So I said 40 million instead of 4 million. So I had to go through a process of cleaning up data as well. And this is the whole machine learning process from like gathering data um, or actually asking a proper question, asking a sharp question is the first one. Gather data, clean up the data, do visualizations, figure out uh, sort of the, the patterns of your data. Uh, we didn't go through transforming features. We'll go through that in a little bit. Um, selecting an algorithm, the straight line, linear regression. We trained the model, kind of fitted a line to the data properly, and then used the answer. 
And then one step I kind of haven't, like uh, one step I left off is, obviously the world changes all the time. So with new laws and with new parameters happening like in the world, the model may not fit anymore, so you have to retrain it and just continuously like get new data. Yeah. Is a sharp question um, unambiguously you know, well -known? Yeah, we'll get to the sharp okay. question in <laughs> just a second, but yes, it is. Um, so, glad you asked, because here's the answer. So, a sharp question is something that, yes, has a straight answer. So, it turns out that there is like five questions that you can ask machine learning. Really, only five. Like, well, five-ish, five types of questions. One of those questions is how much or how many? Like, a number. So, you have to have a proper number that's the answer. This is called regression. And you remember the line was called linear regression. So that comes from regression. So in this case, you can ask things like, what's the price of the house? What's the temperature in, uh, in London on Tuesday? Which you don't need machine learning, but you could. Uh, or how many people will buy my product based on these parameters? You could also, for example, ask, what's the stock price going to be, but the stock price is something that's very volatile and not something that humans can normally predict, so it's very hard for machine learning to predict too, because it's not only based on past performance. Um, so that's one question. And then the next type of question is, is it this or that? Like, so it can be, and this is called classification. So given an email and how it looks, is it spam or ham? Like, is it spam or not spam? Or this person, given all these symptoms, is he going to have diabetes or not? And it can be two classes or it can be multi-class. So if you look at like a news article, you can say which type of news article it is. Music, technology, um, sports, whatever. But it's still classification. The third type of question that you can ask is another type of classification. And that's called anomaly detection. So anomaly detection basically has a lot of normal cases, and then it has a few anomalies. So it might look like classification because it only has like two classes, but it's not because the anomalies are so few that we have to use totally different algorithms to determine anomalies from the normal case. Anomalies being things like fraud detection, like if you look at a lot of credit card st statements or um, in an web log, you can see if a request seems very out of the norm. All of these are supervised learning. So supervised learning is something where you have a lot of data from before that says, given these features, this was the answer. Given these features, this was the answer. So you have labeled data, like things that you know the input and you know the output, and you can just learn from that. Then there is a set of unsupervised learning, um, which is clustering. Um, and this is essentially grouping things, but you haven't decided on the groups in advance. So you might group products, but you haven't decided that you're going to group them by phones and tablets and uh, computers or whatever. Instead, you say, give me some similar stuff. And when might you want to do this? Maybe when you want to recommend something to someone, for example. So a recommender system is good for clustering. So you say, these people are kind of similar. They probably like the same type of movies. Or these movies are kind of similar. So if you like this one, you probably like this one. And you don't decide in advance exactly how you're going to categorize them as like romantic comedies and drama or whatever. It might just cluster like all the Brad Pitt movies together and all the zombie movies together and kind of like the zombie movies with Brad Pitt one. Um, not, not a huge cluster, but could be. Uh, so this is unsupervised learning because you haven't decided what it's going to classify. And then finally, there is another one that's called reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning basically works in another aspect of the human brain, which is uh, penalty and um, reward. So let's say you're a kid, and you touch the stove, and you go, Tch like that, and you don't want to touch it anymore because it was hot and it was red and it hurt. So you got a penalty being that it hurt and you're not doing that anymore. On the other hand, 
if you're cleaning up your room and your mom is going like, good, good, continue, then you might keep doing that. And reinforcement learning works kind of the same way. You have a minimizer or maximizer function that tells you if you're further away from where you should be or closer to where you should be. And this is used in things like trying to get a computer to learn chess or in this case, um, a vacuum cleaner that figures out if it should keep vacuuming or go, and go back to the charger or um, a heat system that should raise or lower the temperature. So these are the five types of questions that you can ask. Obviously, the one we asked was a regression problem because we asked it how much the price of the house was going to be. Then you go through and collect the data. And collecting the data is usually a huge ordeal in figuring out exactly what data you need to collect for your, um, for your machine learning to work. It's an even bigger problem. But I want to just give some hints. If you're just starting out in machine learning because the data collection can be kind of tedious, there are some shortcuts. So you can go through Kaggle. Kaggle is a website uh, for machine learning competitions. So you can make a lot of money going to Kaggle and actually learning machine learning, but you also get the data sets for free that you can work on. UCI is another one. It's a website with stale data sets, like data sets of things that happened a couple of years ago or like basically donated data sets that are now kind of not interesting anymore. And Azure Machine Learning is another place to get data. So lots of good places to get uh, free data from. Like there's like predictions where you can make predictions on Titanic, who's going who's gonna to die and who's not going to die uh, based on a bunch of parameters or wine quality or um, UFO sightings. I have no clue what they're going to do with that, but it's, there, there are plenty of web uh, of data sets and there are just more and more and more the more you look. Independently of how you get your data, um, so your data normally comes from a lot of different sources, but you kind of want to put it together in sort of an Excel-like format, or just uh, a square. Where, so this is for supervised learning. Um, for supervised learning, you then have a target. So this is what you're trying to predict. And then you have a bunch of features. So features are the input parameters to the function that machine learning is going to create. And target is the output. And the features, um, or sorry, the, the row is called an observation or an instance. That is basically the features mapped to the output. Now, so the features can either be numbers, um, and numbers are, are considered something that you can multiply or add or subtract, basically something you can make in mathematical operation on. And then you'll have categories like this one. Is the type of house a detached home or is it a um, townhouse? Um, and since math can't deal with uh, categories, you'll eventually have to turn it into ones and zeros or, or some kind of binary thing. And then you have, oh, sorry, then you have things like the zip code where the zip code kind of looks like a number, but it's not because if you would add zip codes or if you would subtract zip codes, it wouldn't tell you like how far away they were or, or any good information about them. So you have to then turn them into categories and eventually turn them into numbers again. Um, I'm saying this because this is a very important part of like how machine learning works in the sense machine learning is only math in the end. Even if you don't know the math, you need to understand that it's math. Um, so how do you figure out what what kind of data to gather for, for machine learning? Well, there are basically three good rules for this. It has to be relevant. It goes without saying. So it has to be data that actually tells you something about uh, the problem. So how far away from the water my house is. Um, number of chickens in Alabama at the day of the sale, maybe not so relevant. So not something I would pick up. And then you have some that you kind of don't know if they're relevant or not. Is the, the broker, is that going to be important for the sale? Or, or maybe the broker is just, like you don't know cost and effect because maybe brokers just pick more expensive houses and they don't actually um, make the houses more expensive. So sometimes there's difficulties in figuring out whether or not you should 
use something in, in your methods because you don't know if they are the cause or effect. So relevant is one. The next one is independent. So if you have the area of the house in square meters, you shouldn't also have the area of the house in square centimeters. Why? Well, because math is going to then double the effect that this has on the outcome. Like if you have the same information twice, it's just going to sort of double the importance of that. And this might seem kind of like, yeah, of course, I'm not going to have it both in centimeters and meters, whatever. But what if you have the area of the house and the number of rooms? Those are still extremely correlated. So those will still give the same answer. So you have to be worried about features that you bring in that have a strong correlation. So can you calculate the area of the house roughly from the number of rooms? Then you shouldn't use both as the input parameters. And this, the third one is simple. So if you have the GPS coordinates for the house, that's extremely useful because you know exactly where the house is. But how do you use this in math? Like, there isn't a really good way. Instead, you would then transform this feature into something that math can use, which is distance from the water, or distance from schools, or distance from transport systems, or something like that that you can minimize or maximize. So a good deal of machine learning, classic machine learning, is actually taking features that you have and transforming them into something more useful for the model. Now, I have to say, while I'm saying all this, this particular one and the independence one, um, those are things that deep learning takes care of, because deep learning kind of figures out these relationships for us, in a sense. Um, a little bit, not, not fully, but that's kind of the magic of deep learning, that it figures out the relationships. So now we have all these features, and now it's time to explore the data. And you can do that in a lot of different ways, Excel being one. Um, uh, Azure Machine Learning has a lot of uh, good ways to, to explore data and like do diagrams and things. But mostly, you will do that in something like Python. And uh, this is called a Python notebook. So Python, if you haven't used Python, Python is a really cool language in the sense that you can run it in the browser interactively. And you can do something. Uh, like this, I'll show you the notebooks in a bit, but uh, what you create basically is documentation while you code. So you write some markdown, and then you write some code, and some markdown, and suddenly you have like the full story that you can give to anyone else in the project, and they'll understand like how you came to the conclusions that you did. And the other reason why you do something in Python or in R is that both of those languages have really good machine learning modules. Um, and also, for example, TensorFlow from Google to do um, uh, deep learning works with uh, Python and CNTK from Microsoft. Um, and a lot of the modules that are created work with Python. So uh, during the exploration phase, uh, what you do is usually you take a look at what do I have? Um, you try to figure out like all the parameters, are, are they strings, categories, numbers, do I have to convert them, do I not have to convert them, uh, that kind of stuff. What do I expect from them? Do I expect this to have a high effect or a low effect? Because then you can kind of validate it later. And a lot of machine learning, when you create your algorithms and you want to refine them, are about humans then going in and saying, you know what, I think we'll tweak this because this, I know that this would be a factor if I looked at it myself. So that will probably be something that we want to make more prevalent in, in the machine learning process. And then you look for things like missing data and outliers. So, um, and a few other things. So duplicate observations. Duplicate observations is uh, if I have two of the same observations, so in my case, the house prices, on some sites where I would gather data, I would find out both when the house was sold and when it was finally transferred, and it would be listed as two different observations. And when you have two observations like that, and sometimes conflicting, they will skew your data. So you just want to have the one observation. And you want to look for irrelevant observations. So if I want to create a model of townhomes, then I don't want the detached homes. 
to be in there. So if you have something that doesn't necessarily fit your model, then it should not be in there. Outliers is really odd data. So we'll see that in a moment when we look at the actual data, but for example, we have a really, really big house that doesn't necessarily fit the trend of houses. That will then skew my model and make the line go more like this instead of like this. So we want to remove those. And missing data, we always have to have all the input parameters to get the output parameters. So if we're missing some of the information, like if we're missing the area of the house or, or something else, then we won't be able to make a prediction. So in that case, we have to either remove everything that has missing data or do something like guess the missing data, like try to impute it um, before we take it to the training process. And sometimes you have things like structural errors. So if you write things down, you might have sometimes wrote, written down yes, and sometimes why, and sometimes the data was missing, and then you have to kind of clean it up so it's in a format that looks similar. So that's what you do. And after that, you can then go ahead and create like a bunch of diagrams. So this is another reason why Python is popular in R, because they have very good visualization techniques. Okay, um, and then you go through and clean the data. Um, so cleaning the data, and uh, this is a super important data set that takes care of figuring out if a, a superhero wears a cape or not, based on a few input parameters. So we have first name, last name, when they were born, height, and a few other things. So it kind of looks nice, but it's actually a mess. Um, if we look at the birth year, for example, we can see that sometimes it's written down with dots, and we have some before cries and some dashes, and uh, sometimes it looks like some people were on crack when they wrote this, but yeah, we need to clean it up before, before we deal with it. So we simply go through and clean it to the point where it's um, nicely formatted. And BC can turn into a minus, that's okay, uh, just as long as it's in the same format. Then we have the height. And the height is um, one of those parameters that's similar to a GPS coordinate because um, US, um, is it imperial? No. Well, um, you can't calculate them with a calculator, that's it. So you, what you have to do then is you have to transform it to something that you can actually calculate, which is like the number of inches. So in that case, we'll just do a quick transformation and turn it into that. Then we have the birthplace, and the birthplace is a categorical um, with, a few, with a lot of categories, actually. Um, and it's okay to have unknown. Like if, you, if you're missing a few values or if you don't know the value, it's okay to have a category that's called unknown. For the identity, we clean it up to why uh, yes and no. Same thing with if it can fly. And sometimes you then have to go back to the person who gathered the data or to a domain expert and figure out what does this actually mean? Like this uh, weird thing that you wrote down. Here we have three categories, good, bad, and neutral, because Selena Kyle doesn't want to align. And then where's Cape? Again, yes and no. This is what we're gonna predict. All of this takes a lot of time. It takes like, 80, 90% of the whole machine learning process. This is called shaving the jock. Like, it's really difficult too. Um, but it, it does take a lot of time. And sometimes actually when you're done with this and you've done your visualizations and everything, you might not even do machine learning because you've already gained enough insights around your problem that you can just kind of use, like for example, in the case of the Titanic uh, survival thing you find out very soon that it was women and children first, and you don't have to do machine learning and create a model. You can just say if it's a woman, she survived. Specifically, if she was like less than 20 years old, she definitely survived. And if not, didn't survive. And then that's a good, it's a good enough model that you don't have to do and go through doing a lot of training and everything. But, of course, that's not always. So in that case, you would then go through and and do a Jupyter notebook and do some, let's see, not here. So this is um, how the notebooks work. So you can either run them on the web. Um, at Kaggle, you can actually run the notebooks 
at the Kaggle website, or you can run them in Azure ML. So Azure ML is uh, Microsoft's machine learning studio on the web, where you can, for free, do like experiments up until a certain point where you have to start paying per, per hour of training or whatever. But uh, they have Jupyter notebooks that you can run and a lot of other things. Or you can install Python locally and run this as a web server on your system. And um, the nice thing about this is, is that you can then write code, run it, and write some um, markdown and run that. And this is sort of like the documentation I was talking about. So intermingle like text and pictures and, and actual code. Um, so here I opened a file, I looked at columns, I list like the five first elements, stuff like that. Um, so just to show you some examples of the cleanup phase, in this case, I ran some commands to figure out um, if I had null values in my data set. So I gathered a data set from one of the housing sites in Sweden where most people list their houses. And all the yellow ones here are missing. So with a visualization, you can kind of quickly see that there is like a um, toggle state here. So if the house has um, land area, it doesn't have a monthly fee and the other way around. So this particular thing happened to be that the ones that had monthly fees were condos, bostadsrätt uh, in Swedish for my Swedish friends over here. Um, and then you don't own the land, so the land area was listed as zero. So you find things like this, and you find it quicker through visualization, even though this is kind of like stupid visualization, you find patterns like this pretty nicely. Um, I want to just give an example of how it looks when, this is Python, by the way, if you've never seen it before. It looks similar to any other language, except for it doesn't have semicolons, and it works on indentation as far as figuring out uh, when the next statement is. Um, but you would do things like cleaning up the region. So the region is kind of messy because the realtors will sometimes write down, you know, Tribeca and sometimes write down like triangle below canal and then you have to figure out is that the same or not and you kind of have to put them together. So you then write a function in, in Python to, to just clean it up and, and convert them. So similar to what you would do in any other language really. And um, I'm going to go down here and see. So this is uh, one of the diagrams uh, for area, for example, which shows that the area for the houses we're looking at, they're mostly around 120, uh, or most of them are actually between 110 and 160. But then we have this dot up here saying that there are some odd values, like one of the houses was 500 square meters. And then you start looking into why was that house really, really big? And you find out that there was actually an error. Um, whoever, like the realtor that wrote it down, it, was, it wasn't supposed to be 500. And you can also see those kind of outliers in here. And then you clean those up. So it's a process of kind of going through those duplicate values and outliers and everything and cleaning your data. Um, in fact, here I had some other ones that were really, really expensive. And then I looked at the houses on, on Google Maps and found out that they were by the lake. I didn't have information about by the lake. So, but obviously, that now helps me to say, I need that information to make an accurate uh, observation about these. So try out Jupyter Notebooks, if nothing else. Um, let's see where we are. Oh, here. OK, so we've cleaned up the data. And now we're ready to transform some features or create new features. So for example, from uh, the GPS coordinate, we can then create like these how far away it is from, from all these different points of interest. Or, for example, if you're looking at um, how much ice cream you're going to sell, and you might have the dates, you might want to turn dates into whether or not it's winter or summer, because that might be a better uh, estimator for you than the actual dates. Or is this a holiday? Or is this a weekend? 
or something like that. So trying to make as much useful information as possible out of the data that you do have. And now we're kind of getting ready to the actual machine learning. So um, it's been a long stretch, um, but here we go. So there are a couple of different algorithms in machine learning. One of them being the linear regression, like the straight line. Um, and we've seen how that works. Another one um, is called a, a decision tree. So this is a data set where we're trying to figure out if uh, people are going to play tennis or not. You can see the business case might be how many people should we staff in the tennis store. Uh, I'm taking this because this is kind of one of the quintessential like training data sets that is in every single book. But it's uh, pretty good for explaining um, decision trees. So a decision tree um, is kind of like asking 20 questions. So I'm thinking of a person and um, someone needs to like, ask 20 questions and figure out who I'm thinking about. What's your first question that you would ask? Male or female? Male or female, yeah, exactly. That divides like the sea of people into two uh, very big chunks. So if you say yes, you know that we've lost all these. And if you say no, that we lost all these, right? So it's a very good way to separate out. And this is kind of how uh, machine or decision trees work as well. So if we're going to figure out if someone is going to play or not, and we take a look and see, is there something in here that we could use to actually tell immediately if, uh, if they're going to play or not? And the answer is, if it's cloudy, then they will always play, no matter what the other parameters are. So we now have kind of like a decision tree like with branches to say, cloudy, yeah, they will play. So now we can remove all those sets from this. And then we try to find other patterns. So if it's sunny and high uh, humidity, then they won't play. Uh, and if it's rainy and not windy, uh, then they will play. And you get like these trees, basically if else statements in the end. And you do this on the whole set of data, and this becomes your algorithm. Now, Neither linear regression or decision trees are usually used alone um, and because they're kind of crude. And specifically with decision trees, if you do this, you'll end up with something that um, learns things by heart. So you don't want to end up with that because then you're not going to actually be able to predict anything from the new, like from any unseen data that you have. So instead what you do, um, with decision trees is you create shallow decision trees that maybe have only two or three layers, and then you have them vote. Like, so you can create like a thousand shallow decision trees, and you have them vote and say, well, you thought this, I thought this, together we'll think this. Or you can boost and do like a decision tree that feeds into another decision tree. So there are ways to kind of augment simple algorithms to do something more spectacular. But decision trees is, is one, of the, one of the ones. And decision trees can actually use, be used both for classification and for where you figure out a number. Another one is called naive base. Um, and this is an example where we have a bunch of emails. Uh, some of them have spelling mistakes. Like so some of them are spam and some of them are not spam. Uh, the red ones have spelling mistakes. So now. The question is, if you have a spelling mistake, what's the probability of this being a spam email? I won't ask anyone to do math, but it's 75%. Um, and then you go through and you look, it's like, okay, so if it contains the word sheep, then what's the probability? If it, can, if it doesn't have a title, if it's from um, this country, if it's um, sent to these many people, you know, all these properties that the email might have. And then you calculate all these together, you get a probability, and you use that probability to say, this is spam or not spam. So naive base is this is one. And then we have another one for classification. Um, so this is apples and oranges based on sweetness and acidity. Um, think about how you would divide 
the apples and the oranges. Maybe like this. Yeah. So we're back at the straight line again, which is why we call it a regression. But in this case, it's called logistic regression. So logistic regression says, are you above or below this line? And if you're above, then you're something. And if you're below, you're something else. And we can see similarly to when we try to figure out a number for the house, this is also imperfect. Like this apple will be classified as an orange and this one too. And the further away you get from this line, the more probable it is that you're actually classifying things correctly, but you will, like it's still a guess. You will, you will still have artifacts like this. So those are some base algorithms. And then you have neural networks. And I'm not gonna go in deeply into neural networks. If you weren't at Barbara's um, session, go ahead and watch it online afterwards. It was really good. Um, but we have a set of inputs and an output. And what we do now is we create, um, we take, for example, the size in the bedrooms, and that becomes like the family size for this house. Um, or walkability or school quality, like we create all these new features in layers. So this is one layer that transforms this into this. And this is one layer that transforms this into this. And eventually you'll have like a large number of layers that you don't know what they do. Like so the key here is um, while it might look like we're actually creating this layer and deciding what this layer will do or what this small uh, algorithm will do, it doesn't. Like neural networks, the magic of neural networks is that it figures out these layers for you. So it figures out like the relationships between the features so you don't have to. Yes? Even though it's figuring it out, can you look at it later on? So if you <coughs> find out <laughs> yeah. in human terms what it is. Yes. So um, yes and no. And this is kind of like the the problem of machine learning as it stands today, actually, because um, deep learning is super nice in that you can usually get pretty good results with it, but traceability is horrible. So, and if you don't have traceability and you don't know why it guessed what it did, then you might be doing it on totally false premises. So a typical example is, um, um, one algorithm that was supposed to figure out if uh, something like a dog was a husky or a wolf. And they had really, really good accuracy until um, it was found out that it was only looking at the snow in the background <coughs> and making that classification. Or um, something like it, uh, in the underground, figuring out patterns of like how many people are actually on the underground. And it was, again, doing a really good way, like a really good classification, but it turned out it was just looking at the top left corner where the clock was. So um, those are kind of funny, but in some cases it can get like you're classifying because of all the wrong reasons, like race or um, other things that you don't necessarily want to classify on. So the answer is a little bit like, so in imagery, like if you're classifying images, which is what most neural networks are used for, then there are ways to visualize it. So the layers will typically be, like first you have all your input pixels, and then the first layer might find sharp edges. And the second layer might turn those sharp edges into a square or a circle or something like that. And then in the next layer, you put together the, sh the squares and the circles, and it becomes an ear for a dog or something like that. And you can kind of visualize that with different tools. But a big deal in, um, machine learning right now is trying to create traceability and trying to create transparency to the point where you can actually see what's going on. Um, and it is a huge problem because um, so I was involved in, in this uh, project where we were looking at retention, so figuring out if someone was going to leave the company or not. And we got super, super good results in the beginning, like we were classifying like 95% correctly. And when you do that, you should kind of think and say, yeah, maybe that's, that's not that credible. So it turned out that it was looking at um, the performance evaluation of, of the employees, 
But the problem was that for a lot of the people that had left a long time ago, there was no performance scores. So they were defaulted to zero. So it could easily tell that everyone who had a zero score would leave the company. And obviously, that doesn't help anyone. But yeah, traceability is a big, big deal. And it's very hard. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> yes. So when you work with images, you yeah? cut them down in, in certain bits. Like how, because that's, all the data is kind of numeric or, or categorized, yes. which is, an, again, a numeric value. Mm -hmm. But when you have an image, you have to pre-process it to that Excel format somehow, right? Or yeah. So. So I urge you to look at uh, Barbara's uh, session because she was explaining it um, a little bit better than I would be right now. But yeah, you have all the pixels. And depending on if you're using like a convolutional neural network, it, it still keeps like the relationship between like where you are in the picture okay. and figures that out. So in that case, you will do like processing on very small parts of, of the picture and putting things together. There's um, a really good... Uh, YouTube video that's called, um, I'm trying to figure out, um, friendly, a friendly introduction to neural networks. He's really, really good. So you should look at that. Sorry. <laughs> it will be a very long answer if I, <laughs> um, okay. So what algorithm should you use? Uh, and the answer is not always neural networks because, um, Sometimes you need that traceability. But there are plenty of cheat sheets. This is one from Azure ML um, that you can use to figure out what to do. And the reality is that you will take, for example, we say two class classification, then these are some reasons why you might want to use this one instead of this one. But in reality, what you'll do is you'll try all of them and then like on a smaller subset of your data. And then you figure out, okay, so this was really good, so I'll keep kind of improving on that and optimizing um, something we call hyperparameters, which basically, for example, if we say we have linear regression, but or polynomial regression, where it's like a curve like this, deciding on whether we should have like a two degree curve or a three or a four or whatever we should have. Um, so you keep tweaking like the algorithms after you've decided that this is a very good fit. So used to kind of talk about it a little bit, like, so logistic regression is good for things that are easily separable by a line, whereas um, a decision tree is good if you have, like, little square pockets of, of data like that. Um, and usually, like, the ones that will perform the best are normally some kind of decision tree-based algorithm. Okay, so now we get to train the model. Uh, and training the model kind of looks like this. You feed in the data set, you clean the data, and you split the data uh, into a test set, or sorry, into a training set and a test set. And the reason for this, I'll let you take the picture. The reason for this is because we could technically have a really good model. We could have a model that looked like this and fit every single one of the dots. But when we get new data, we wouldn't necessarily be able to predict anything at all. Um, and instead, if we would um, use a straight line, we might not fit everything for the training set correctly, but we, we have a much better way of fitting like new data. So doing this uh, orange thing is, calling, oh, is called overfitting. Now, if we make the model too simple, it's called underfitting. And then we might need to, to move it into multiple um, degrees. But figuring out if you're overfitting or underfitting is a matter of first training the data and on a train set and then testing it on a test set. And this is done like, sometimes you do it straight like this in the beginning, but eventually you will want to use most of your training data if you don't have that much. So you use something called a cross-validation fold where you have techniques for being able to use like four parts of your data tested on one, and then use four other parts of your data and test it on, on another. Um, and then once you train the model, so training the model is basically saying, I want to use this uh, algorithm, create a model for me, and then you go back and you score, basically you take this data set and you predict 
right? And you say, what are the values here? And then you evaluate and see how far off were you given a lot of different criteria. So it looks like this in reality. Um, now, you can do this in, uh, in Python using code or in R. Um, and Barbara was showing how to do it in Python with neural networks and TensorFlow. This is kind of like a drag and drop environment, um, Azure machine learning. So it's a very nice getting started environment. It has some limitations when you get up to doing really complex things, but um, it's a very good prototype uh, deal that you can at least get started and kind of figure out what um, what your models are going to be like. So you drag and, and drop basically is placing random things on here. Let's see what I did. Oh. I guess I didn't drop anything at all. But So what I've done here is I brought in my data set that I cleaned in uh, Python. And if I go in and look at it, um, and it's just an Excel format with all these different parameters and the price is my label. And I can do things like visualize, uh, let's say I have the, the area, I can then compare that to uh, price and I can get a visualization showing like this scatter plot before. And then I went in and said, with meta edit metadata is one of the modules in here. I went in and said that some of my um, fields were categorical, so it will automatically turn them into ones and zeros. Um, select whatever columns I want from the data set. And there are modules in here and in Python that will help you figure out which ones are the best parameters to start with. Because sometimes you have 10 parameters, but you might only want to start with five and see how well you're doing with that and see if you're actually increasing or decreasing precision weight um, by adding more. And then splitting the data, in this case we split, so we're training on 80% of the data, testing on 20, and then you start running this. Um, so in this case I have like 9,000 rows, so it takes like 30 seconds or less to, uh, to do this. But you then end up with a trained model, and I just wanted to show like a decision tree and how it looks. So you can see there are many different decision trees. All of these are decision trees that will then kind of vote with each other to figure out what the correct answer is. But this is a particular one. And let's see if I can scroll up. OK. So in the beginning, it says if the land area is over 614, uh, it will go this way. If not, it will go this way. And it's basically it's an if-else statement thing. Uh, and then you end up with a trained model that you can then apply to, to the test data. And when you test it, it will then look like this. So we have the, um, the price. OK. We have the price right here. And then we have a scored label. So this is what it thought the price was going to be for this house. And obviously, there is a difference here. And that's the difference we're trying to minimize. And then we have, in the end, an evaluation that we can look at and see uh, for these two that I was testing, like a, <coughs> a decision forest and a linear regression, um, which one was best. So. 0.77 is the coefficient of determination that kind of is a co coefficient between one, 0 and 1 that will tell us how good we're doing. And this is one of the things that we can try to improve or monitor. Um, and that's essentially what you do to, um, to do the machine learning. Now, we talked about looking at how good your model is. Um, and this is for classification. So again, looking at ham, uh, sorry, spam or not spam. Um, and in this case, we have, I guess, 1,000 uh, emails. Some of them are spam. Some of them are not spam. Out of the ones that were spam, I sent 100 to the spam box and 170 to my inbox. 
On the other hand, out of the ones that were not spam, I unfortunately sent like 30 to my spam box and 700 to my inbox. And now the question is, how good is this model and what actually matters? So there are three different uh, ways to calculate this, one of them being accuracy. So accuracy is basically how many did I actually get right? 800 out of 1,000, right? But in the case of spam, the question is, is it more important that I actually identify all the spam, or is it more important that I never send an email from my grandma to my spam box? And the answer is, you shouldn't send non-spam to your spam box. So what you're trying to figure out is a way to minimize this number. So in this case, we have 130 that were sent to spam, and I managed to get like a 76% precision on what I was sending to spam. On the other hand, you might have a problem where you're identifying people that might have cancer. And in that case, you might be, want to send a few extras to the doctor for an extra check. In that case, you want to look at the recall instead, which is the other line of the true positive or the true positive or true negative thing. So this is true positive, this is true negative, false positive. Well, well yeah, either way. This is called a confusion matrix for good reason. Um, and this is part of what you use to determine what you want to, uh, like how to optimize your machine learning model. So, and again, decide on what you want to optimize and then start working from there. Now, figuring out like the parameters for the algorithms, you can also do through code by specifying what you want to optimize and it will, it will kind of do a grid search and figure out what parameters will do best. So, and then finally, is use the answer. Using the answer in, in Azure ML, you can basically just go through and create a website or a web service out of this, when you can pass in input parameters and it will give you the answer. Or batch processing, where you can send in an Excel file and it will automatically like rate everything for you. But at this point, we're kind of at the end, except for. Um, except for that we also should continuously retrain the model because things will change. Um, and like AI and machine learning is kind of, like it's been through a few uh, rough times with, because it started off kind of like a heuristic system and, and now we're kind of at a sweet spot where we have a bunch of data and a bunch of computing power that actually lets us do really good machine learning. So these are just two statements that I think are, are kind of interesting. Data is the new oil, kind of referring to that data is whatever fuels the system, and data is now becoming like a very, very strong commodity. So if you look at big acquisitions that companies, like the big companies, for example, like Microsoft or Google or other companies make, they don't necessarily make acquisitions that will, um, will give them um, immediate benefit as far as like um, how much money they will make, but they make acquisitions based on how much data that company owns. So data is a very strong commodity. Um, the AI is the new electricity by Andrew NG. He's the guy who's, who does it, like he's a big name in deep learning. And his statement here is essentially, um, he's like electricity transformed like essentially every industry AI is now on the verge of transforming every industry as well. Um, and I think um, I want to leave you with, with a few thoughts. Um, because it's transforming every industry, we're kind of at a place uh, where we have to take responsibility for the way it's transforming things. So uh, real, like AI is really, really good at doing things that humans can do in a split second or less. Uh, for example, looking like if you're a really skilled doctor and you look at um, an image of uh, an MRI scan, you can figure out if someone has a tumor or not. But it takes skill. That's skill that machine learning can learn. So even really skilled, um, like even uh, professions that require quite a bit of skill can quite easily be automated with machine learning. So we have to take responsibility and figure out like sort of where where we want 
all these people, including ourselves, because a lot of our jobs are also going to be automated, um, how we're kind of going to continue and make use of, of the real power in our brains and, and that kind of stuff. And the other thing was something that um, John was talking about, like the traceability and figuring out like the first off, how did we come to a decision and also is that a decision that we really want to make. So if you look at something like using machine learning for hiring and you've always hired um, white males with beards to do programming, is that going to be your future? Because if you're using machine learning and looking at your past, that will be your future. Because machine learning will only learn with whatever has happened before. Another example of that is um, something that you see a lot. Um, and I know uh, Facebook made a big statement uh, just recently saying that they will now give you more power over your feed. But if you have a particular political view or if you have a particular interest, you probably notice that every time you do a search or every time you look at your feed, that interest or that political view is kind of like continuously is given to you back over and over and over again. No one would kind of dispute your facts except for maybe a few of your friends that, that have a different opinion. So you end up in this bubble of confirmation bias where everything you see is something that you've already decided that you wanted to see. And if you're not challenged by something new, your views will never change. So we have to kind of look at that and take that into account when we think about machine learning and, and AI and how we want to do this. So thank you. That's it for me.